You're listening to a podcast from thespoilist.com. Cyberspace, the new frontier. These are the voyages of the podcast First Contact. Its mission, to explore every episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. To seek out new viewers and have new conversations. To boldly view what many have viewed before. Welcome to First Contact, the Star Trek The Next Generation intro cast. This exists because our dominatrix wanted to punish us in the most cruel and unusual way. I'm Andrew. I'm James. And I'm Alex. This week we are looking at Home Soil. The story was by Carl Gurs, Ralph Sanchez and Robert Sabaroff. A teleplay by Robert Sabaroff and it was directed by Corey Allen. It first aired the week of February 22nd, 1988. James, what's this episode all about? The Enterprise visits a Federation terraforming colony who seem less than pleased to see them. When an away team beams down to the planet, all seems well until a crew member is killed by a laser drill apparently acting on its own. It turns out there are weird twinkly lights on the planet, so the crew take one up to the ship and inspect it. Could this be non-organic life form? Of course it could. They've been trying to communicate with the colonists for months, drawing shapes in the sand, writing on the bathroom mirror, sending emails, but they were ignored because the colonists are all idiots. Now they want to destroy the Enterprise. Luckily, Picard convinces them of their peaceful intentions with some tasteful mood lighting. Well, that sounds like a very exciting episode, but I've seen it before. Alex, what did you think watching it for the first time? Well, when I sat down to watch this episode, my girlfriend said to me, oh, what episode is it that you're, you're watching this time for this next podcast? And I said, well, it's, it's Home Soil. Oh, I'm so. Yeah, no, that's a good episode. That is, yeah, you like that one. It's a good episode. I thought, oh, brilliant. You know, good episode. We haven't had many of them. So sat down, started watching it. And I thought, yeah, no, no, this is actually what I think of being, you know, quite a core Star Trekky kind of idea, which is a shame because it was so, so very, very boring. Do you know? I'm quite surprised to hear you say that because I think. This is a really competent episode. I think my expectations have been lowered this season. So when something just basically ticks the boxes of not being offensive and not having the crew do something completely stupid, I kind of welcome it in some ways and go, yeah, that was a good one. When if I was judging it against any other television, it probably isn't. I I don't know, maybe I'm just being overly harsh, but but I, I, well, that, that was the best that I could say of it. You know, it, it was competently written, which admittedly raises it above a lot of the other episodes that we've seen. Yeah, you know, but I, I don't feel like it was doing anything exciting, and, and the whole plot was more or less just going in a direction that I was expecting from the start. You know, I just found that my attention ended up wandering. That's all. I thought it was, as you say, competent for the first three quarters of the episodes, and you thought. Well, the the fans on the feet with the show, and this does feel like next generation, you know, the pulling away from the original series. And then the crystal life form starts talking, and you are thrown right back into the original series style of episode. Ugly giant bags of mostly water. I think a lot of the problem starts right at the beginning. Because with the next generation, maybe Star Trek in general, you do a certain amount of second-guessing right from the start of the episode. I mean, take the last episode, for example. We see Riker, and we see a child, and we see him bumping into the child, and he looks at the child affectionately and smiles, and we think, okay, yeah, yeah, we get the idea this is going to be a a child-centric episode. Fine. With this episode, it starts, and Picard is talking about terraforming, 
So my mind immediately did the mental maths and goes, right, terraforming, they'll be terraforming a planet and they'll discover there's already life on it and that they're inadvertently killing the thing on there. And so we'll end up with a very standard Star Trek type of plot of a group of people thinking they're doing something good, but they're accidentally doing something very bad. And they'll find out that the things that we thought were evil aren't, and it's really us. Well, it's so standard that they've already done it in the original series. The episode The Devil in the Dark is about the manning on a planet, and then there's this evil alien race killing people on the planet, and then it turns out the alien race are the good guys, and the miners are the bad guys. Which is pretty much what this turns out to be, kind of. Which is sort of putting us back where we were at the start of this series, you know, when we were doing episodes that were either ripping off episodes from the original series or just doing something very similar. And, you know, even when we've had shaky episodes in the last few, there's at least been something about them that's felt a little bit more original. This just... Well, it didn't feel very ambitious. And I I think that was a problem. You know, whereas we've had different types of ideas in each episode, more or less, for the last however many episodes, it felt too much like we were settling back into a groove, and it, it, it just wasn't inventive enough for me. Do you know, interestingly, I've got the, the guide to the Star Trek The Next Generation here, and the it has a little production uh, section at the end. It says, this story's theme of unintended destruction echoes that of original Trek's Devil in the Dark, in which a silicon-based mother creature attacks the miners who are unknowingly taking her eggs. This TNG, however, was a lacklustre show, which Hurley recalls as the one where just about everything that could have gone wrong did, including pages having to be written the day before shooting. Yeah, well, none of that surprises me. I mean, that... That that is exactly what I would have expected having watched it, to be honest with you. Because there's also various things that either aren't resolved properly or start up and then just go nowhere. I mean, to be specific, the one that really sticks in my mind is when they've all beamed down to the planet and you've got Mandel grabbing the hydraulics expert and saying, shouldn't you be doing this? Oh, what, now? Yes, I I think so. And he says it in quite a sinister way. Then seconds later, the hydraulics expert is dead and the audience is left with the sense of, ooh, I bet it was Aaron Randall that did it. Yeah, it's probably going to be him, isn't it? You know, or why else would he have been acting strangely like that? Yeah, it's just an odd way to play that out if there's going to be nothing else that comes of it. It's almost it's purposefully there to make you suspicious of him. And when you don't have anything at the end of that, it just doesn't work. From the very outset, we are being told to be suspicious of Mandel. He comes on the view screen and Councillor Troy who can sense from orbit that somebody is a bit dodgy he was panicking up to that point but it turns out at the end he wasn't really hiding anything so why the panic if his only concern at that point was that he was a bit behind with his terraforming operation oh god yeah and how annoying was Troy I mean you got that whole um well we're very busy he's hiding something Yeah, yeah, I get that. I'm not sure we can have you down here on the planet until... Thursday? He's definitely hiding something. He doesn't want you there. Yeah, I get it. I I get it, okay? Yeah. Maybe you'd be better off leaving and just letting us carry on. I don't think he wants us here. Really? Really? Do you think... Well, thank you, Councillor, for stating the bleeding bloody obvious. Thank you for that insightful little tidbit. Where would we be without you? (laughs) Then when you get down to the planet, she's talking about the designer, Louisa, as if she's not there. She's commentating to Riker about how trustworthy she is, when she's right in front of her. She's just rude. Though I would say this episode does have the first time in which her telepathy is useful she knows that the guy is being killed in the other room that's the only time Troy has been useful on this show up to this point whereas the blood curdling screams weren't a clue well the blood curdling screams came a few seconds later so you know 
She's a great early warning system, Troy. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly the same as that gag in Red Dwarf 8, with Holly saying he has some inside information that there'll be an inspection in ten minutes, and Rimmer and Lister should keep it under their hats, only for the guard then to come into the cell seconds later and tell them there'll be an inspection in ten minutes. Uh, It's comical. At the outset of the episode, I thought that it was going to be a, a variation on the thing, where, you know, it's a remote outpost and some unknown force is slowly killing all the crew members. It doesn't really go down that sinister way. I think in the early moments it does have more of a horror movie kind of vibe about it. Nobody knows who was controlling the laser. Was the laser controlling itself? Is the station itself trying to kill people? And that's maybe a bit more interesting than ultimately the way the episode turned out. Yeah, and I think that's the episode that I would have preferred. You know, a sort of murder mystery. I mean, we've not really had that, actually. That You know, that would have followed down that line of having more varied plots each week. Yeah, no, that 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 would have been good. I, I, I would have liked that. Whereas what we actually get in the second half of this episode is just a repeat of what we had in Data Law, to, you know, to some extent. I think the reason I liked the episode was it did feel quite Star Trek. It does feel like they're not at war, they're not attacking anyone. It is discovering a new life form. I I think I like that element of it, even if the life form isn't very well realised. And something that really stuck in my court was that they spent so long debating in the second half of the episode whether crystals could have life. You know, they're all there going, well, how can it be alive? It's inorganic. We've never seen anything like that before. And you just want to say to them, are you sure? Are you absolutely sure about this? Yep, never. Never seen a crystal that's alive. I've never seen a crystal that has life. Yeah? Well, what about a few weeks ago? You remember when Law turned up? Remember that big crystalline structure? Remember all the trouble that caused you? Yeah? Wasn't wasn't that alive? Oh yeah, well crystalline structure. Of course that was alive. It's a bloody crystalline structure, isn't it? Always turn out they're sentient, them crystalline structures. You see a crystalline structure and you ask, is it alive? Wasting your time, that's what you're doing. Of course it is. It's a crystalline structure. But you've never seen a living crystal. No, no, never. I guess there's a debate to be had about whether you could consider data to be alive. But maybe we should save that for a future episode. Yeah, well, I don't think this is any time to to judge the measure of a man. The thing is, in the Star Trek universe, we have seen such a great variation of life anyway. I mean, you you couldn't say Q was, by any sense, a, a conventional life form, but there's no debate as to whether he's alive. He's not carbon-based, I'm guessing. So it shouldn't be surprising that a starship on a strange planet is finding a strange life form. No, no. It's not surprising in the slightest, which is what made the second half so dull for me. You know, it was just the fact that we seem to be spending so long, either in the lab or on the bridge. Um, Obviously, it's playing on the idea of the mystery element. But it, it didn't feel like there was... Of mystery. You know, obviously it had life. It was obvious from the moment they found it. When Geordi and Data first encounter the alien life form and they're looking at it and it's flashing in a pattern, I thought maybe it was going to hypnotise them and going to make them do weird stuff against their will and that's what was wrong with Mandel because he was under mind control. But no, they were just going to take them up to the starship where it would be a fairy light in a jar. I had an issue when they were looking at that light anyway. You know, with Geordie saying, Wow, it's amazing. It's blinking on and off. It's almost musical. Right? Uh, Okay. How? How is it musical? Rhythmical? Maybe. Maybe. But musical? Not really. Oh, all those varying rhythms. It's harmonious. Huh? Rhythm? Harmony? Yeah. Two different things, though. Well, is Geordie deaf? 
maybe he's never heard music. I mean, is Jordy deaf? That's what we've got to determine. Maybe that visor thing that he wears is like gives him subtitles for when everyone's talking. Well, could be worse. Could be blind. Well, he's obviously not blind. I mean, Data asked for visual assistance, so he's definitely not blind. I think I think the subtitle thing. I think that works. I think they established that in Encounter of Far Points. Can't remember. He didn't have many scenes. So, and presumably, the crystal life form has no vision. It has no. It can hear. How how does it hear? And it calls them ugly giant bags of mostly water. How does it have a concept of what's ugly and what's what looks good? Maybe they get fashion TV. It does seem strange that they are able to judge by our standards when really they. They're little flashy crystals that live in saline. What should they have to say about good looks? What do you think of the actual look of them? They're basically LED bulbs in a jar. I'm just going to put it out there. If that's supposed to be a really advanced life form that puts everyone in awe, if you give me ten minutes just to nip down to Maplin's, I could knock up that. And I could get you more than two lights. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, we'll be quids in. More than two. Yeah, I I could have around five. Can they talk? No, but they can flash all together, one at a time, intermittently. Mm. And mine are red. Oh well, there you go. That's that's pretty impressive. One of the scenes that. I don't know why, but it irritated me when they're scanning the bulb and then they're asking the computer philosophical questions. Theorise as to source and the computer says, life. Oh, well, I'll take your word for it, computer, then. I'm glad you're able to determine that. We couldn't actually have asked those questions of ourselves, but if the computer, which we've basically asked to wildly speculate, says it, then it must be true. Yeah, it's a bizarre feature of a computer, isn't it? Computer. Discount logic. Okay. Well, if I'm discounting logic, then obviously it's Arthur Haynes painted green and dancing the Watutsi in the Huddersfield Thunderdrome, then. So, the talking crystal, we know it's alive, I suppose, or we get confirmation because it's trying to hack into the Universal Translator. And that might have been good if they'd used the computer more to, to have it talking, but what do you think overall of that? It's a bit hokey for me. Yeah, it wasn't very good, was it? I, as James has said before, the whole fleshy bags of water thing was a bit... Uh, ooh, uh, no. Uh, oh dear. No. no. It, it does sort of harken back to the floaty head alien in The Last Outpost or the satellite injustice where you've just got an, a disembodied alien voice which... I think we should probably be getting away from at this point. It's very original series and it's tired even now. We've seen it in multiple episodes in Star Trek The Next Generation and there was a better way that you could have used flashing lights to communicate. I'm sure they could have done something more original but as we've said, a lot of this is just going through the motions. It doesn't feel like it's really doing anything I, I mean the light splits in two okay it, it breaks the containment field okay they have to quarantine the lab and it breaks a bell jar but pff, I mean that's about it you know it, it takes over some of the ship's electronics you know all right but you know Riker can overwrite them from a door panel it's not that important and then it gets terrifying when Picard turns the lights off and and also, Picard is insistent that they aren't trying to kill them. You know, we aren't doing that at all. But that is exactly what he is doing. He is doing exactly the thing that will kill them. No, it's I guess it's the equivalent of um, waterboarding. Oh, well, that is lovely, isn't it? Come to the Federation and get waterboarded. Do you enjoy autoerotic asphyxiation? Then we're the guys for you. That that Riker's special advert. Picard should have a special understanding of 
non-carbon based life forms it was just in Lonely Among Us where he got turned into an energy based creature and then got into the computer system a bit more competently than this life form I mean he was at least able to put P for Picard on the screen (laughs) these ones just managed to create some kind of lame alien voice with extra echo added yeah I I just can't even get worked up about it because it's it's not offensively bad like that was. It's just, yeah, well, that's that then. And Jesus, there's still ten minutes to go. I think this discussion <laughs> has highlighted that we have seen all of this before. There is basically not a single original element in this. And it's put together, like we say, in a competent way. I suppose a workmanlike way. But, you know, it's almost like my first Star Trek screenplay. There is very little there to distinguish it from anything, ever. And as such, what can you say at the end of this podcast other than we have seen this episode? You know, nothing more, nothing less. So why not? Round it up some extra thoughts that we might have had in our quickfire round. Quickfire. Now, when the hydraulics expert is being shot to death, they go through the door and they see him in a burning, crumpled heap on the floor. Then we cut to an ab break. When we come back from the ab break, Riker has already made a log entry. No one has bothered to go and help the dying man. (laughs) And then when Picard gets in touch, he says, well, there's not a lot of point in helping him now. Even if we did get him back, he'd probably die from his injuries. Wait, so you don't want to go and deal with the man that, by your own admission, may very well in all likelihood possibly be not dead? I don't understand why they can't just transport him up. Surely that could have been the first thing they did, because they do offer to do the same for Data when he's stuck in the room with the mad laser. Why can't they just do that? Nobody needs to hang around the door avoiding getting shot. You have tools that can deal with this. Well, usually in future episodes they just say, oh no, there's a a shield around this room, which means we can't transport up. But they're not even competent at this point to even say that. Louisa, the, the designer who is one of the colonists. Troy has had no luck speaking to her, so she sends Riker with a bit of a wink, saying, maybe you'll have better luck. Did anyone find that scene very strange? What, a crying woman? All on her own? Of course Riker's the first on the scene. I don't see anything strange there at all. Who else? And he uses the line, it's very beautiful, I could arrange for you to see it if you like. That is not the first time he said that. That's all I'm saying. We will send you home to your wet sand. You leave my wet sand out of this. So you knew about these lights? Well, yeah. And you you knew they were shifting the patterns in the sand? Oh, yeah. But you never questioned that? Nah, never thought anything of it. These people would make the worst crime scene investigators of all time. The, there's blood on the carpet. Is there? Oh, hadn't I even noticed. There's a head in the fridge. Is there? Is there? I thought that was a lettuce. <laughs> Silly me. There's, there's a note from the killer with a signature, a passport photo and a print out from Google Maps with his location highlighted and captioned with the words, I'm in this building and tied up. Come and find me today or I will kill again. <sighs> yeah, but I mean, that could be from anyone really, couldn't it? Picard says to Mandel, you know the Prime Directive, implying that Mandel shouldn't interfere, but... Just recently, in Angel 1, they said it was only Starfleet officers that had to obey the Prime Directive. We have a Prime Directive problem every week. This is just another one of those. Well, after what we've learned here, perhaps it'll never happen again. Really, I mean, that is the best that you can think to say at the end of all of this. I mean, I know it was tedious, 
but you couldn't think of something a little more interesting than, well, we certainly won't be doing that again, I can assure you. Can I remind you that a man died? There was a couple of lines that slightly elevated this episode. I I liked sarcastic Picard in the meeting room when he says, oh yes, do tell us, in reference to the patterns in the sand. He's really got sarcasm on there. Worf, talking to the computer, I wasn't asking you. Quite right, Worf. Dr. Crusher asks all the questions of the computer. You just stick to actually using some decent reasoning and playing Pong. There's a line that could sum up how this episode fits within the season. A year's work destroyed. Well, I think we can definitely all agree that that was an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Thank you once again for listening. We will be back again soon to see Wesley Crusher coming of age. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.